We're going to see if we can build a Panasonic 3DO from spare parts. And we're going to do it right now. Mark fixes stuff. This is my bucket of Panasonic FZ1 3DO spare parts. It's the remnants of the many, many consoles that have been sent to me and have been repaired. I've got top shelves, I've got shielding, I've got drives, and I think I've got a controller port somewhere. It's all kinds of crim crams and schmutter. I used to have quite a big collection of 3DO stuff from back in the day, until the fire claimed it as a sacrifice to the 3DO gods. Well, I can't build a console out of this box, because I need a mainboard. And that's changed, because I found this on a Japanese auction site. It's one of the early Panasonic FZ ones from Japan. It features the additional kanji ROM which allows it to play Japanese 3DO titles, but it also features an AB switch, which switches the normal 480i interlaced output to 240p. Much nicer. Now, these capacitors are probably fine. I've never found any bad ones. And likewise, this battery is probably fine as well, incredibly after all this time. But there is a problem with these capacitors here because they tend to get cooked by the 9 volt and 5 volt regulators. This causes the two smaller capacitors to burst their seals and leak on the board. And we can see that's happened here. At the very least, we'll need to change these two capacitors. I suspect they've gone high ESR and they're probably heating up a little bit on their own. There's a mix of SRAM brands here as well, and I know some of these run hotter than others, so I thought this would be a good test case to use our Hick Micro Eco Series handheld thermal camera. This model is the E01 and was sent to me by Hick Micro themselves, so thank you so much. A good quality thermal camera is a great diagnostic tool. This one has a great manual. It also has a calibration certificate, something that's missing from cheaper models. Registration will give you an extra 180 days warranty, and it's a bit of paper. I decided to ask Zach to unbox this because he's much, much less childish than I am. And he doesn't get up to half the shenanigans that I do. So thanks for that, Zach. It's nice to see that there's not a lot of waste inside the package, just the essentials. The unit feels really nice in the hand, and because it has a trigger, Zach thinks it's a blaster from Star Wars, because he's a boy. The screen is really nice and bright, which is what I need in a filming environment like this. There's a really handy thread to mount it on a tripod, really handy. And the cable has a switchable USB-C and USB-A on the end. You can get pictures off of your unit by plugging it into your computer, and you can charge its internal battery using the same cable. There's a whole host of features which I'm probably never going to use, but a useful one for me is being able to change the colour mapping on the temperatures. There's black hot, all kinds of things. I think my favourite's iron bow. And if you're like me, you're going to forget what the temperature was after 30 seconds, so you can actually take pictures. And that's really useful. The first problem we're going to encounter with testing our 3DO is that Japanese machines require 100 volts AC. In one of my previous videos, I converted the USA 3DO to 240 volts AC by changing the transformer. We're not going to do that yet, so we'll use a step down. A horrible, inefficient step down. Honestly, these things are horrible, wasteful, clunky rubbish. But at least we can see if our unit works. For visual output, we'll be using our fateful Bench LCD because it's got great connections including S-Video, which is the best video output you can get from an unmodified 3DO. In fact, it's pretty damn good. I always have a bit of trouble with these. I'm never sure the right way up. With the screen on and S-Video in selected, we power on our console to see if we get anything at all. And we do get two LEDs, which is a really good sign, but it looks like the picture's missing sync. That could be down to the cable, or even the way I've plugged it in, so I gave it a wiggle. And firing up again, we got a solid image, and no lack of sync, although there's also no picture. This is normal though, because the 3DO won't boot without a CD drive attached. Once the machine had been on for 5 minutes, I thought I'd check the thermals around the power section. The two smaller caps are reading around 28.5 degrees whereas the larger cap is reading a much cooler 25-ish degrees. 
On the heatsink, we have a 9 volt and a 5 volt regulator, which are really throwing out the therms, around 55 degrees centigrade. And that RAM is really curious as well because some of the chips are much, much warmer, and they're probably the ones that are being accessed during boot up. It's really useful to see the thermals of chips in a circuit. And we can also see how wasteful that step down is. Some US versions of the console came with a fan and you can see why. In fact, it's crazy it was taken out in later revisions. OK, these caps seem to be working at the moment, so let's see what happens if we hook a drive up. Of course, plugging in a drive will create a larger draw on power, so the console might not work at all with it attached. Here's some drives in the box that I've repaired with my resin printed 3D gears from a previous video. And I almost forgot we're going to need some ribbon cables. They match up to the ribbon cables on the back of the drive. I'm pretty sure I have some in this box. I've got two types of lids here actually, a matte one and the shiny one which has speckles printed on it. Ah, and here we go, there's the skinny one and there's the wide one. That should do nicely, they look fine. Making sure that the power's turned off, I insert the ribbons into the board. These ribbons actually seem to be double sided, so I'm not sure if it matters which way round you put them. I could be wrong though. Inside the 3DO FZ1 is an inordinate amount of shielding, but we're not going to pop that on for the moment. We're just going to rest our drive on these standoffs. And as is the tradition with ribbon cables, it's far too awkward to be able to film yourself putting them in, so I'm probably going to block these, but you get the idea. Making sure the ribbon cables are firmly inserted, we can test our console. And I don't know whether this is going to work. I mean, I genuinely don't. But I hit the power button anyway, and see that the laser's moving, so that's a good sign. This laser is actually looking for a disc. It will try to focus on the disc, and once it's found it goes to the table of contents. Otherwise it says it hasn't got a disc, tells the console, and the console moves on to its next part of its boot sequence. And hooray, it's actually working. So now it's going to ask us for a disc. Let's pop a disc in and see if the spinning disc puts so much strain on the power section that we can make the console fail. If it does fail, we'll see it partially boot and then reset itself. Luckily, I changed the eject belts in all these drives, so simply pressing the eject button will make the drive smoothly come out. And we'll pop our copy of Wicked 18 into the drive. Not my favourite game, I have to say. Still better than Lemmings though. Let's see how far we get. And it seems to be booting to the publisher's logo. The disc is spinning smoothly. On the subject of video, I want to show you why I want this particular mainboard. It's because it has the AB switch. Now, if you look at the screen close up here, you can see it shimmering with the interlaced 480i. When I flick the switch, you can immediately see the 240p is much more stable. Let's flick that back. 480i and 240p. That's why I want it. OK, I think what we need to do is take this board, replace those capacitors that we know will be an issue in the future, and then see if it runs and see if the temperature of those capacitors when it's running are any lower. The bits of plastic everywhere are from the smashed top of the console and the reason I got it cheap. Right, let's change these caps. Let's unplug from the step down transformer first. And let's actually put that out of the way. We'll also need to remove the S-Video cable and I think that port needs to clean. And there's only two screws actually holding the motherboard down, so I'll need to find some additional screws when we put our new Franken console together. I can't lift it out yet because I've forgotten to take out the AC cable. With that removed, I can lift the board out of the base of the console. And let's take it to the workbench. This is a relatively small job, which we're going to make light work of by using the desoldering station. We're just going to remove these two caps, have a bit of a clean up and pop the new ones in. We're going to replace them with good brands. We have Rubicon and Panasonic today. And both of the caps are rated for 105 degrees C at around 2000 hour service life. 
Now we've got the front of the console out, I've found another remnant of its little accident. This is a part of the clear plastic LED light pipe. It should be attached to a larger piece, and it's obviously had some trauma. I can only apologise on behalf of my sleeve for ruining the shot. But regular viewers of the channel will know what desoldering looks like by now. At least I hope you will. I will try harder next time. With the first cap out, I can see there has been some leakage, which has probably run underneath this cap. Out of curiosity, let's see how bad the old cap is. And 1.34 ohms isn't actually that bad. I'd be expecting around 0.5 of an ohm. With the new cap, we're getting 0.22 of an ohm. So that's kind of what you're looking for in a fresh cap. Now let's remove the 1000 microfarad cap. These are usually okay as well. It's just their proximity to the smaller cap which leaks means you have to clean underneath them. I'm really giving my all as I'm pulling it off. How satisfying. For cleaning the boards these days, I use this window cleaner with vinegar solution. Because it's a mild acid, it actually neutralizes the alkaline leakage that you find after a cap has leaked. It takes up the electrolyte, but it's not too harsh. Afterwards, I mop it up and then I wipe it down with isopropyl alcohol to displace any water-based cleaner. And that's really starting to look okay now. Let's pop the 1000 microfarad cap into position, observing the polarity markings and fire up the old soldering station. We'll be using it at 340 degrees Celsius. And of course, we'll be using leaded solder. With the leads soldered in, I simply clip them off with the side cutters. The second cap slips into place. And again, it's soldered in. And both legs are then clipped. Right, with that done, let's take it back over to the computer bench and test these capacitors. I've already popped it into the case and have connected the S-Video cable. Next, we plug it into our step-down transformer and hit the power switch. Two LEDs is a great sign, so I leave it on for five minutes and then I check those temperatures again. There's not much in it, but the new capacitors seem to be running one or two degrees lower temperatures. But of course, the integrated circuits are still hitting the same temperatures because that's normal for those ICs. They sure are toasty though. I'm always mindful that one day I might have to replace all the capacitors in a 3D OFZ1, but it's not happened yet. It's always just been the ones in the power stage. Let me tell you about my plans for this pile of bits. I want to use the parts in this box to make an entire console, but not just any console. I'm going to install this 3D OFZ1 ODE, which was designed by Fixelsan. I'm then going to try to hook it up to this SSD. It's 480 gigabytes, so should have enough space for all the games that I want to play. And I'm really hoping that this SATA to USB 3 cable will do the trick, although it was £2.66 on AliExpress. Because I only have one Mankey controller, I'm going to make this, which will allow me to use my PS3 controller and a mouse via USB. I'll also adapt the internal transformer so it works on UK voltage and no more step down. Fantastic times ahead. If you're able to help me on Patreon, I'd be really grateful. And big thanks to Hick Micro for sending the thermal camera. A massive thanks to my amazing patrons appearing on the screen right now. Patrons get ad-free early access to all my videos and some exclusive content, whether they want it or not. Patrons also get the ability to run faster than the speed of sound. That might be a lie. Seriously though, it would really help me. I'm deep in the hole for this cabin right now. <sighs> right, well, I think I'm going to end this video here. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.